Um, so I wanna, again, welcome everyone this evening. Um, the United Nations Association of St. Louis is hosting our um, you know, semi-regular advocacy gathering. Um, this is our first for the year um, where we're looking really at advocacy and how it relates to the United Nations. Um, I'm gonna briefly introduce um, the United Nations Association uh, for those that aren't familiar and for those who are familiar to give you kind of an idea of what's going on this year. Um, so once again, thank you for joining everyone. So about the United Nations Association of St. Louis. So our mission is really to inform, inspire, and mobilize um, Americans to support the principles and vital work of the United Nations and its agencies. And it's with these principles that we conduct our, the work of our organization on a regular basis um, in order to build greater understanding um, you know, for the United Nations uh, amongst our St. Louis region. A lot of the work that we do also here is, um, you know, in 2015, the United Nations um, adopted the Sustainable Development Goals or 17 Global Goals for Sustainable Development um, with the end goal of achieving these 17 goals by 2030. And so a lot of the work that we do here in our community is to address these goals and advance them uh, here at a local and regional basis. And one program in particular that we have coming up uh, this summer is our SDG Changemakers Youth Action Program. Um, that will be this July 12th through basically the 23rd. And it's for high school students, uh, predominantly at the Cortex Innovation Community. Um, and more information can be found at our website slash changemakers or una-stl.org slash changemakers. We're excited for this program. Um, you know, given the pandemic, we are looking at a virtual option in case we need to, but, um, but this will be held in person um, at the Cortex Innovation Community at, and at locations around the St. Louis region. So we encourage anyone who's in a high school or knows of a high school student that'd be interested in participating in this to be a change maker in our community. We encourage everyone to, to get involved. And to join our movement here locally, we're on Facebook, social media, um, such as LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. So we encourage everyone to connect with us there and even to join our movement. So we'll have a lot of members and non-members here this evening. Um, and if you wanna join or get involved more, more formally, um, you can get involved by going to unausa.org slash join. And we'll include that in the link um, it's great for, for students, for youth, and for all, um, you know, individuals that are passionate about the work of the UN. So moving on, I want to introduce um, first our chair, Pamela Greer-Hibbler, and thank you for leading this, this evening's discussion. We have also special guests that Pam will be introducing. And I also want to thank our, uh, the committee members that we have in our advocacy committee uh, that have been organizing our work and our, our advocacy agenda um, for this year. So thank you all. And uh, I'll hand it over to you, Pam. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We have um, a dynamic speaker this evening that I want to introduce to you. Marco Fabian Sanchez is a first generation young professional with experience in digital advocacy, public engagement and policy communications. Recently, Marco worked on the Biden-Harris presidential campaign where he helped to mobilize hundreds of online communities through strategic digital organizing. And currently Marco serves he in the position with the United Nations Association of the USA, where he builds grassroots support for the United Nations in the US. Throughout his academic career at California State University Fullerton, Marco helped to lead mobilization efforts in the Southern California community through Representative Gil Casinas California 39's GOTV campaign in addition to campaign political work and grassroots advocacy, Marco has a personal interest in human rights and international economic development given his previous role as a policy consultant for the World Bank Group. 
through his experiences in advocacy, his, organization, his organizational development and public leadership, Marco has been able to successfully engage everyday Americans and lawmakers through his academic and professional career. We're very fortunate to welcome him tonight to share some of this insight with us. And um, I thank you for joining us, Marco. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And hello, everyone. It is so great to see a few familiar faces and those who are new, welcome. Um, those who have not met, my, again, my name is Marco Sanchez. Thank you, Pamela, for that very uh, nice introduction. Um, I, I would like this conversation to be very informal. Um, feel free to, to ask questions. Of course, at the end, um, I'd be happy to answer. Um, but if there are any pressing questions, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, so if you, in case you need to write it down, um, I can scroll back and, and answer questions, of course. Um, but overall, my goal tonight is to ensure that, um, you know, I'm giving you a, a, a brief introduction on what advocacy means through the UN perspective, um, because it could mean a lot of things. Um, and in fact, there, there are a lot of challenges and opportunities ahead of us, um, which is super exciting, but I want to ensure um, that, you know, I'm, I'm utilizing my time wisely um, so that I can give you the necessary information and insight um, to help you as a chapter, to help your programming and to help inform next steps on what y'all wanna do as a chapter to tackle advocacy in your own community. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because I do have a presentation. Um, before I begin, if um, folks don't mind uh, letting me know where you're from uh, in the St. Louis area. If you're from St. Louis proper, um, that, let me know that you're from St. Louis, but um, I'm always interested to, to learn where folks are dialing in from. I know right now in the, in the pandemic, um, and I've told Carlos this, but it, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that we aren't able to gather in person because one of my, my favorite um, parts about my, my role at UNA USA is being able to meet our members and our grassroots constituents that, that do incredible work in their own communities on behalf of UNA USA and on behalf of the UN. So hopefully we will return to that, um, that aspect of our lives in the near future. But for now, um, you know, we will continue to, to serve in this virtual space and, um, you know, hope you all have been staying safe throughout these very challenging times. But with that, I um, wanted to just review some goals that I wanted to go over um, tonight. As you know, uh, the Biden-Harris administration recently passed the American Rescue Plan, um, which has now been um, signed into law and, and not, is now in effect. Um, I wanted to review what that means through the UN's perspective, because there is um, some um, pockets of money allocated for international assistance, um, and specifically for um, you know, different UN agencies and programs that are doing work um, you know, for, for COVID response uh, abroad. So wanted to highlight what sort of um, impact the American Rescue Plan has on that. And then of course, um, wanted to discuss the, the fiscal year UN funding recommendations. Um, no, that's a big word, um, at least, you know, for me, before I started working here, you know, the understanding how funding works and how um, the UN gets his money could be a very complicated, uh, you know, thing to understand, but I will try to be as um, concise as possible and answer any questions, um, of course, that I can as well, um, but wanted to review exactly what we are advocating for. Um, as Carlos mentioned, the United Nations Association of the USA um, is an organization that works to inspire, educate, and mobilize Americans to support the vital work of the UN. And in particular, when it comes to mobilizing, we are mobilizing folks um, to, to urge their members of Congress to support the United Nations and specifically to support full funding for the UN. And so um, that leads to my third point. Um, you know, we'll review just briefly kind of advocacy opportunities that we have ahead of us, how you all can get involved as a chapter um, and support our advocacy uh, work in, in this year. So with the American Rescue Plan, um, there is a lot to cover. Um, and I won't go through the specific numbers that you see here because this is um, very specific. Um, 
but it is important to know, and I, I rest assured, and Carlos, I can chat with you afterwards, but I, I do want to send this PowerPoint um, to folks and, you know, for those who want to look at it further, because um, there are specific numbers here um, that I'm sure um, folks would want to look at. But as you can see, there, there are a lot of different pockets here that went to different um, international assistance programs um, to help the fight against the global fight against COVID-19. Um, you know, as I mentioned, this is this was a an aspect of the American Rescue Plan, um, but I will say uh, it was a very small part of the 1.9 trillion dollar um, package. Um, you know, there of course most of it is going um, you know to to different programs here at home um, to fight the the, the COVID 19 pandemic and to help uplift our country from the traumatic effects that we've been experiencing this past year, but. Um, members of Congress on both sides of the aisle um, were champions of um, providing some assistance for international aid, um, which was something we are proud about because both Republicans and Democrats were supportive of some of these numbers that you see here um, for foreign assistance programs. Of course, at the end of the day, um, you all know that the American Rescue Plan um, as a whole passed without any Republican votes. Um, but that, you know, with all that said, um, it is important to know that we do still have uh, Republican colleagues who, who are champions um, in, in some sense for, for international assistance funding um, when it comes to USAID, for example, or the Global Fight Against AIDS, two, two programs that have received um, Democrats and Republican support. So what's next? Where do we go from here? Um, you know, as I mentioned, the Funding for the global response to COVID-19 was very, very small um, in the American Rescue Plan. In fact, it was just 0.34% of the, to the total bill. Um, so just some uh, factoid for you to be aware of um, when you know folks, of course, um, start spewing numbers, um, you have these numbers to, to counter back. Um, but now that the American Rescue Plan has passed and is signed into law, uh, we are now focused on uh, the fiscal year budget um, because Congress has to pass a budget, they have to negotiate, and they have to get it to President Biden's desk for signature. Um, this is protocol every year for Congress. Um, so that is next. Uh, we have not received the president's budget request. Um, everything seems to be a little slow this year, just in general. <laughs> um, typically, around this time of year, the president already releases his budget request, but there's been uh, a lot consuming this administration in the first couple of um, weeks. And so uh, we anticipate the president's budget request to come out actually in April. Um, so we are keeping an eye out and seeing where the administration's priorities are. Of course, as some of you know, um, the president's budget request is a political document, meaning it is, um, it is ne the way that it is written is never passed into law, whether that's a Democratic president's budget request or a Republican's president's budget request. Um, which is why our advocacy is so important to members of Congress, um, because they are the ones that negotiate um, the final numbers, and uh, we we need to ensure that you know our voices are being heard to their offices, um, so that they know that they have constituents that are advocating for for full funding for the UN. So went briefly over. Um, you know the the key aspects of the American Rescue Plan. I wanted to shift a bit and talk about our posture and how we are talking about advocacy in 2021. Uh, last year was just uh, a whirlwind, I'll say. Uh, there, you know, Everything changed and we weren't prepared for anything. And we had to shift and adapt every single program and the way we talked about the United Nations and its work. Um, and we had to fight back a lot of um, the threats that we received from the previous administration um, to, you know, to politicize the UN and the WHO, for example. Uh, now with a new Congress uh, and a new administration, uh, you know, we have a re renewed opportunity ahead of us to really get things rolling and um, get started on the right foot. And so overall, uh, UNA USA's issue area themes uh, for 2021 um, will similarly reflect last year's in the sense that we will continue to talk about global health 
We'll continue to talk about the work of WHO, why it is so important. It is great that the administration has uh, you know, made commitments to return to the WHO um, and among other, you know, commitments that the administration has made, such as returning to Paris, uh, you know, returning to the Human Rights Council, for example. But we need to take that to uh, the next step uh, and ensure that we are meeting our financial commitments and, uh, you know, expanding on those financial commitments as well, uh, given that, you know, over the past four years, we have accrued over one billion dollars in arrears to the United Nations and its affiliated agencies. And so there, there's a lot of rebuilding um, that we need to do. Um, so we will continue to tackle that through a global health lens. Uh, we will also continue to tackle this through a racial justice lens. Um, UNA USA is committed to ensuring that uh, we are continuing to talk about racial justice and its intersectionality with COVID, its intersectionality with climate, um, climate change, its intersectionality with gender inequities. Um, and so we want to ensure that um, this is top of mind um, and that we are also um, integrating diversity, equity, and inclusion into our mandate as an organization and um, ensuring that we are setting an example for our chapters as well um, so that they um, also follow suit. But of course, our, our core ask uh, will remain and that is to ensure that we are um, you know, urging our members of Congress um, to fully fund uh, the work of the United Nations. Uh, and you know, all of these issue areas have intersections, um, but we will, um, you know, overall, we will continue um, to build off of these issue areas, um, similarly to the way that we did in 2020. The way we're doing that is a little different though. Um, you know, last year, as I mentioned, was a whirlwind. Um, you know, I think we were on a very defensive um, front. Uh, you know, we were very protective um, and there was a lot um, that we just had to respond to um, because of, um, as I mentioned, the threats that, um, you know, we, we received um, from the previous administration um, that were unprecedented. Um, I think now with uh, just this new chapter ahead of us, uh, we have an opportunity um, to really use our communications to be more empowering, uh, to be more forward looking. Um, but most importantly, to, to give it into the hands of our, of our grassroots, of our chapters and our members, um, for them to remember that um, the work that you all do is impactful. Um, but it's not only impactful, it's needed. Um, I think for, for the longest time, uh, again, for the past couple of years, um, we've been asking for a lot. Um, and I think sometimes it's hard to forget, uh, or it's easy to forget, I should say, um, that the work that we do is important. Um, so, you know, we think that it is important for us now um, to take a step back and to remind folks um, that this is, this is a, an incredible opportunity ahead of us, and we need to rally together as a community, as an organization, um, to start again, um, essentially, um, on a lot of um, different fronts. Uh, we are replicating a lot of our um, communications from the Better World Campaign, which is our, our sister organization. Um, and they launched a, a uh, initiative, as some of you may know, um, called Get Us Back. Um, and so we will uh, you know, use that type of narrative um, to, to get the US back um, on track with our progress with the SDGs, our progress um, on achieving X, Y, and Z issue, um, because there's been so much damage done over the past couple of years. So we've talked about the American Rescue Plan. We talked about our posture and communications about our advocacy. Um, now I wanted to get into um, what can be conceived as boring, but important um, you know, aspect of our advocacy, which is the budget recommendations. Um, again, I won't go into full detail on all of this because it is a lot. Um, I, I will be sure to, to send again this uh, presentation for you all to look at. Uh, we do have a document that outlines our budget recommendations in detail, which again, Carlos, I can send to you um, among other resources for you to look at, um, just so that you can have that in your hands. But overall, this is what we're asking for this year. Um, it's, it's pretty similar to other years um, with some um, room for expansion, um, specifically on the peacekeeping front. Um, you know, as I mentioned, over the past four years, um, we've occurred uh, 
a lot of arrears. Uh, we owe a lot of money to the United Nations uh, because we have not paid our dues. And a lot of that money um, you know, stems from the fact that we have not paid our dues to, to our peacekeeping um, assessment. So the, these are the numbers that we are urging members of Congress for. Um, there, there are specific buckets that go into these accounts. These are the specific accounts that are outlined in the congressional budget um, for reference. Um, but again, uh, you know, I won't go into the full detail on all of this because it is a lot, um, but wanted to share this for reference because this is our guiding document um, and overall what we will be urging members of Congress um, to, to do um, from now until, you know, when the budget gets passed, which is likely going to be at the end of this year, um, assuming Congress gets along and there is no government shutdown. Um, but with, with all that said, um, like I said, I will be sure to, to send all of this to you um, so that you have this in your hands. So the, those were um, the FY22 budget recommendations. Wanted to quickly review our engagement opportunities um, coming up uh, where you can help us support our advocacy um, uh, goals for, for this year. Uh, overall, as I mentioned, there's a lot of opportunities ahead of us, um, but specifically we want to encourage you um, as a chapter to think about ways that you can engage your own members of Congress, whether it be your um, local House members uh, or your senators as well. Uh, you know, I, the St. Louis chapter um, has, a, has a great history of engaging with members of Congress and you all do a rock star of a job um, in getting those meetings scheduled, but know that you have uh, support from the national office. Uh, we have um, a national network of chapters, um, all of which have varying levels of experience with advocacy, um, but we are here to help. So whatever um, you need, um, we're happy to help. We are right now in the midst of updating our talking points for this year. Um, I will be sure to send those to you once they are um, you know, fully updated and approved. Um, but Congress will be going on a, on a recess um, this year in April, at least it's scheduled um, around Easter. Uh, I think uh, the House is actually starting a bit earlier in late March. Uh, but with all that said, you know, there is an opportunity ahead uh, to, to meet with your members of Congress. But, uh, you know, because we are still living in this virtual world, um, the spring recess and, you know, these, these breaks that members of Congress take to go home and whatnot, they're, they're kind of arbitrary now um, because everything is virtual and everyone can meet online, um, you know, whenever. So your members of Congress have never been more available. Uh, so I encourage you to, to, you know, think about a timeline that works best for all of you. Um, and again, if you all need any help, I'm happy to help schedule those meetings and to follow up with offices if they if need be um, to ensure that you're able to get a meeting in the books. Um, we have a, a great campaign that we recently launched at the beginning of this year too, um, called My SDG Dream. Um, if you have not heard of it, I encourage you um, to check out our website at unausa.org. Um, throughout this year, we are encouraging our members to share uh, their SDG dream, meaning why uh, the SDGs are so important to them with less than, uh, you know, less than 10 years left until uh, its deadline. Um, and we are planning on sharing um, these voices and these stories to, to the Biden-Harris administration um, so that they know uh, that there, there is a constituency of Americans that um, support the work of the SDGs and that we are counting on them um, to um, ensure that we are upholding our commitment to the work to the framework of the global goals. Um, again, I can share this link after uh, this call so that you have it for reference. Um, and the last thing that you see on here is our week of action, uh, which is crazy that I'm already talking about uh, because we just finished our global engagement summit, but you know, on to the next big thing. Um, every year we gather here in Washington DC for uh, what was formerly called our leadership summit. Um, but because we are still living in a virtual uh, space, we are going to be replicating what we did last year, which is uh, our week of action. And we are going to be having programs throughout the week um, and, of course, scheduling meetings with your members of Congress uh, to ensure that 
um, you are able to meet with them um, during this high level week that we typically do every year here on Capitol Hill, um, but instead we'll do it in a virtual space. Um, this also aligns right before the UN's 76th anniversary now. Um, so it, it'll be a, a great opportunity to engage in advocacy uh, at the beginning of the summer. So that's kind of a look ahead over the next couple of um, weeks, months, but wanted to take this time now to see if any of you had any questions. I'm going to group chat, see. Yeah, and if anybody has any questions, you can unmute yourself, um, I believe, or raise your hand if you prefer. Go ahead, Arthur. Well, I'd just like to ask uh, if from, from your perspective, um, is there any particular Republicans in Congress who, um, there used to be a whole wing of the Republican Party that was internationalist in nature. Are there any particular Republicans now who you think are um, uh, particularly positively inclined towards the United Nations? I knew that question was coming because it mm -hmm. always comes up. Um, you know, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I, I will say, I, I will agree with you in, in, in your comment about how, you know, there was a delegation of folks that, that we previously uh, used to rely on, uh, so a lot of which have, have left uh, Congress one way or another. But, you know, with all that said, um, despite the political challenges, which are very real, I'm not going to uh, sugarcoat it at all. They are, they are very real, and it is um, extremely challenging um, to, to reach um, some folks on, on the Republican side. But there, there are still champions. Um, you know, there, there are a, a couple, I'm not sure about any in Kansas, um, specifically, um, but I, there, there are a few um, that we still have relationships with. And in fact, there are a few freshman members of Congress um, that got elected uh, th this past cycle, um, which we are keeping an eye on, um, seeing, you know, where, where they stand on certain issues um, and, and seeing how we can work with them. Um, but Senator Todd uh, Young, for example, um, is, is one Republican that we've worked with in the past. Um, Jeff Fortenberry is another one. Um, Senator uh, uh, Cassidy uh, is another one uh, that we've worked with. Uh, so, you know, there, there, there are uh, a few, as I've mentioned, that, that we continue to rely on. Um, and you know we 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 have to um, see where um, where we can give and take um, oftentimes, um, but it you know I, like I said I won't sugarcoat it. It is a challenge, um, especially when uh, you know you have a, a deeply divided Senate uh, that is literally um, drawn in half. So we shall see how how it ultimately ends up working out um, in this Congress. Thanks. Ashley, did you want to go then, Bobby? Yeah, I just wanted to add in that um, our experience with the, our Missouri legislators, um, like Marco was just saying, we kind of pick and choose, you know, what narrative we really want to take into their offices. Uh, we've gotten good responses from Senator Roy Blunt's office on things like, um, you know, vaccine distribution abroad. Um, so he is uh, a pretty big proponent of global health. Um, Josh Hawley's office, uh, he's literally written articles against the WTO, but um, so we, we really come to him with uh, issues maybe of religious freedom, which he's a big proponent of. And then Agwa Ann Wagner out in the second district, she, um, she's done a lot of work with human trafficking, uh, which our uh, chapter is also focused on. So we really just try to curate, at least for our Missouri, Missouri legislators, um, you know, look, look at their record and see what they're um, about and what they're interested in and try to, um, you know, uh, curate what we take to them. And thanks for raising that point, Ashley, because uh, yes, you know, curating your message is super important when it comes to advocating for any issue, really, um, to your members of Congress. And there is no better person to do that than you, um, the constituent. 
um, because I'm not from uh, the the areas that you all are uh, grow you know have grown up in or you know are are living in right now. Um, but you know the area more than I do, um, so that is something that you uh, definitely should use to your advantage when when meeting with your respective uh, representative or senator. Did you have a question, Bobby? So my question, it also deals with messaging. Um, I work predominantly with middle schoolers. So we're talking sixth, seventh, eighth graders. Um, and it's a wonderful group. They're so optimistic. Um, but what issues would you recommend that you could say that the UN is like concretely working on that I could use to pitch that? Because they're all for lobbying members of Congress and letting their parents know and letting teachers know the things that they care about. But how do you tie that into the UN and the, the overall mission that they're working on right now? Yeah, that is a great question. I would look no further than the SDGs. Um, you know, there, I think there is a lot of opportunities there, especially with young people. Uh, and this is especially exciting this year because every year the UN goes through a review of the SDGs. Um, and the US is, I anticipate at least, is going to be an active participant, unlike the past couple of years. Um, and so it'll be important to, to see what, what the administration will say about our own progress about the SDGs and um, other nations' progress about the SDGs and where there's opportunities for growth and opportunities for collaboration. With all that said, um, you know, I think the, the SDG framework is a great way to get young people involved, especially kids who are um, still learning about the UN overall. Um, I think they, you know, the framework itself is very relatable to a young audience. Um, so I would um, suggest that you, you use that, um, you know, if you're planning on using that in your classroom, for example, um, to make it relatable to, to kids. Great, thank you. Stephanie, you want to go ahead? Yes, um, Marco, thank you. So that so Bobby's question and your answer kind of leads me to to my question of um, I know that COVID has set us back, has set the UN back with its objectives by 2030 with the SDGs. Um, significantly, there are six SDGs that were were pointed out as um, having really gone backwards, not just halted in progress with um, gender equality and of course, global health and, and environmental issues. So I was just curious, is there any talk about extending that 2030 deadline for those initial objective goals that were set? Because I feel like we're not going to make that and, and then what? That is a great question. And I wish I had the answer to that. Um, but I do not, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, I, I will say, like I said, um, it. I think we have to keep our eyes and ears to the ground. Uh, there's, there is a lot of, um, I think, just surprises that may happen uh, in the next couple of years, um, especially now that, you know, there. I think for the past couple of years, because of our absence, there's been a lot of holes um, that have been filled by China, for example. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the US counters that now. Um, and then once, uh, you know, once and if uh, the US does counter that, um, how they're able to, to work with partners and, and other countries to, to negotiate things like, for example, extending the goals of the SDGs. There, there's just a lot of layers um, and complicated uh aspects that come with all of that to, to make that final decision but i anticipate that um that discussion if it hasn't been had already will happen soon thank you thank you maria did you want to go ahead with your question good evening thank you for for doing this um advocacy and i have a question in regards to um, I know you have some really goal, goal, great goals and um, what you're trying to accomplish, but um, in some of the areas that you, you're trying to concentrate, especially, um, we are seeing that those countries are not being, um, the COVID vaccine is not getting, 
Uh, so how can we achieve anything if we have not um, met the most important thing here at at stake for all for the world itself uh, is getting that those vaccines into the people that need it and even if you provide it to the governments how is it really going to get to the people that really need it i mean sometimes <clears throat> they receive it i mean a lot of these uh, governments receive all this aid but it never gets to the people that are are in need and so um I, how can all this work out if we don't take care of that first? Absolutely. Um, I mean, the biggest problem with all of this is lack of uh, resources, and which is why it is so important, um, you know, to to address our 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 own country's financial commitments. Um, because the matter of the fact is, is that the U.S. funds a great majority of a lot of these programs. Um, which these programs, by the way, are, you know, for example, the World Food, Food Program, are, you know, these are folks, uh, boots on the ground in the field, uh, you know, working and establishing, uh, you know, processes and operations to distribute, uh, you know, whatever resources they're distributing to, to the people, but they can't do that if there are no resources for them to do so. Um, and so this is a larger problem, um, again, that we are kind of um, addressing from the bottom up um, uh, or from the top down, I should say, uh, and trying to, to, you know, go back to the drawing board, basically, and saying, you know, we are behind on a lot of our, our financial commitments and we need to not only just get started, but we need to fill in the gaps that we've left void for the past couple of years. Um, because a lot of these agencies are, are simply struggling. And um, as you've mentioned, Maria, there, you know, a lot of these countries are not getting the resources um, that they need because of the lack of, um, you know, fi financial uh, development commitments that they, you know, been lacking from countries. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the broader uh, issue overall. Um, but it starts with um, ensuring that we are, that we are investing essentially in these programs because they they haven't been invested in for the um, past couple of years. Okay, thank you. I think Zukai had a question in the chat um, also about um, supporting the UN if the UNA, if you see that, Marco, since the association yes. has, for the, yeah. I think I'm having trouble understanding the questions you gave if you wanted to clarify well i'm just thinking that he's asking if um if the una um in general ever critiques some of the actions that the united nations is planning to take or or any of the sdgs um are the goals for the sdgs is there ever any kind of um pushback from una with what the un is planning um we haven't been critical of any pushback or of any um, of the UN's framework necessarily. Um, we've been critical of the lack of commitment um, from certain countries like our own for, um, for the SDG framework, um, but not necessarily critical of the UN. Mary, Beth, you wanna go ahead? For your presentation, um, I'm wondering if the UNA, uh, USA has some graphics that would show uh, relative to these topics that you are so wonderfully uh, discussing and explaining. Do you have any graphics to show that, you know, where the US is in terms of its contribution or lack thereof on uh, specific topics, you know, or maybe even pairing them with the S, the contributions with the SDGs, you know, is there anything that you can really put out there and get a good uh, one shot picture of, you know, knowing, you know, where the US has stood and it might, you know, if, if the admin present administration would see it, it might really jumpstart them to, uh, you know, get on the ball. Absolutely. Yeah, um, we we use a lot of um, the content, digital content, and of course, written content 
um, that our Better World campaign um, sister organization puts together every year in their congressional briefing book, which includes graphics and it includes, uh, you know, short paragraphs that explains this very complicated mess um, to members of Congress and to other elected officials too, including the administration. Um, that has not been finalized for this year yet. Um, that is still a, a work in progress, but I was told actually today, um, and you are the first to hear this, that it should be available uh, by the end of this month. Um, so that is super exciting. Um, and that will have, a, you know, hopefully, uh, Mary, some of the graphics that you are um, talking about. Thank you. Did anyone else have any questions? Um, real fast, Marco, I didn't see it on the slide. How much um, is the U.S. in arrears now to peacekeeping and to the general fund? I have to look specifically uh, at peacekeeping. I know that overall, it, I think the overall arrears is $1.15 billion now. Um, so it has surpassed the, the billion mark. Um, but I mean, there, there are two um, buckets of peacekeeping. There's, um, you know, the assessed dues uh, with, and then, you know, kind of voluntary contributions overall, but we are still, we've committed to them, um, but they are voluntary at the same time. It's complicated, but I can definitely look into the specific number on, on peacekeeping um, and get back to you, Ashley. I, I just don't remember off the top of my head. No, I, I was just curious what, it, what it's gotten up to you. <laughs> Probably a big number. Well, this has been a great dialogue. Um, we want to really thank Marco for taking time and we're appreciative of all of you for taking um, a little bit of your evening to spend with us as well. Before we let you go, we do want to um, let you know about another St. Louis chapter advocacy event coming up and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Stephanie um, from the United Nations St. Louis board to give us a little detail on this. All right, thank you, Pam. And thank you so much, Marco, for, um, for giving us that valuable information tonight. So four weeks from this evening, which would be Tuesday, April 20th, same time, 6.30, we have um, Don Chapman and Karen Nickel joining us to give us an update of um, their nonprofit organization they started eight years ago called Just Moms STL. And um, it's, it's centered around the West Lake Landfill in Bridgeton, Missouri, adjacent to the Bridgeton Landfill, which is, is burning. And there is a lot of concern that that fire could eventually um, reach the West Lake Landfill, which is actually radioactive waste. And, um, and there's more waste in the soil and in Coldwater Creek that runs through neighborhoods and in that area of St. Louis. And so they're just, they're going to update us on the situation of um, the Westlake landfill. And we're gonna connect it of course to um, environmental issues and um, in, in SDGs and again, work that the UN is doing. So we would love to see all of you there. Thank you, Stephanie. So Carlos, did you want to um, say any closing remarks? Yeah, um, thanks again, Marco. And thanks, Pam, uh, for leading um, and our, our advocacy committee. For those that want to help support advocating for um, the UN and topics that we were discussing this evening, um, I'll, we'll leave a link in the chat box where you can actually go and advocate online um, and where you're your members of Congress will receive um, will receive your um, you know will hear from you um, directly and, and they might even message back. So uh, that's a big part of you know us advocating here um, in this virtual environment. Of course, we'll continue to meet with members of Congress on on these topics. And if anybody here wants to get more involved in advocacy work. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to us, myself, Pam, any here, anybody on our team, Stephanie, Ashley, um, Bruno, um, and we'd love to have you involved as we expand our advocacy efforts here in, in the region. Um, 
and build more support. But just want to thank uh, Marco again for, for joining us this evening. And, and thank you all for participating. Um, and I hope it was eye-opening for everyone, especially for those that aren't necessarily, um, you know, uh, members of the organization and for new members as well. Um, so, and thanks Savitri, also your work on, on our committee. So, um, yep, that's all I have to say. So if you want, have anything else or if Marco, you have anything else you want to mention before the end? Um, no, just thank you, um, everyone. Like I said, it's always um, neat to be able to, to meet with our, our folks that are doing incredible work uh, on the ground and in their communities. Um, I hope I have the privilege of meeting some of you uh, in the near future once we are all vaccinated. Uh, but until then, stay safe. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And we hope to see everyone again soon. Have a great evening. Thank Thank you. You. Oh. Night.